for joining me on Global News in Zulu, Nigeria. We begin with U.S. holds Israel weapons amid Rafa concerns. Judge indefinitely delays Trump's classified document case. United Nations says three million flee Myanmar conflict. Xi counters claims of China aiding Russia in Ukraine and bites down sues U.S. over TikTok seat law. Last week, U.S. President Joe Biden's administration halted a shipment of weapons to Israel in opposition to apparent steps by the Israelis to invade the southern Gaza city of Rafah, a senior administration official has said. Biden has been trying to head off a full-scale assault by the Israelis against Rafah, where hundreds of thousands of Palestinians have sought refuge from fighting elsewhere in Gaza. According to a report on Tuesday, unnamed United States officials said the U.S. started to carefully review proposed transfers of particular weapons to Israel that might be used in Rafa in April when it seemed Israel appeared close to making a decision on the assault. As a result of that review, we have posted one shipment of weapons last week. It consists of 1,800, 2,900 kilometers bombs and 1,700, 500 225 kilogram of bombs the official said adding that we are especially focused on the end use of the bombs and the impact they could have in dense urban settings as we have seen in all the parts of gaza we have not made a final determination on how to proceed with this shipment according to a report four sources said the shipments which have been delayed for at least two weeks involve boeing made joint direct attack munitions jdams which plays precision guidance systems onto bombs as well as small diameter bombs. Reporting, report rather citing on name officials, it was reported early on Tuesday that the U.S. had delayed the shipment of some 6,500 JDAMs. The delay comes at a time when Washington is publicly pressuring Israel to postpone its planned offensive in Rafa until it has taken steps to avert civilian casualties. The White House and Pentagon refused to comment on the shipment delays. On Monday, Biden held a phone call with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and emphasized U.S. opposition to a ground offensive in Rafah, according to the White House. But in the early hours of Tuesday, just hours after Hamas, the group that runs Gaza said it had accepted a ceasefire proposal put forward by international mediators. Israeli forces seized control of the first Rafah border crossing. Without addressing whether there had been a holdup in arms shipments, White House Press Secretary Karen Jim reaffirmed that Washington's commitment to Israel's security was ironclad. The Pentagon said on Monday that there had not been a policy decision withhold, to withhold arms from Israel, the U.S.'s closest Middle East ally. The Rafa crossing is critical for both aid and an escape route for those able to flee into Egypt. Some 1,400 million Palestinians, including over 600,000 children, are sheltering in the southern city and the United Nations, U.S., Europe Union and international humanitarian organizations have cautioned an attack will be catastrophic. Israel's war on Gaza has left many of Gaza's 2.3 million people on the brink of starvation and led to protests in the U.S. and other countries demanding that universities and Biden withdraw support for Israel, including the provision of weaponry. Now on judicial matters, a United States judge in Florida has adjourned indefinitely expressed in Donald Trump's trial on charges that he unlawfully kept classified documents after leaving office. On Tuesday, U.S. District Judge Arlene Cannon said Trump's trial will no longer commence on May 20th, 20th but she did not set a new date for the proceedings to begin, casting for the doubt on whether he will face trial before the November poll when he hopes to win the presidency for a second time. Trump faces loads of charges accusing him of illegally keeping top secret documents that he took from the White House in 2021 after losing the election to Democrat Joe Biden. Also accused of thwarting the FBI's efforts to get the papers back, Trump has pleaded not guilty and denied wrongdoing. The prosecution and defense had both acknowledged that a mid-day trial will possibly need to be delayed given still unresolved issues in the case and because Trump is presently on trial in New York in relation with alleged hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels during the 2016 presidential election. 
The New York case involves many of the same lawyers who are representing Trump in Florida case. Judge Cannon, who was appointed by Trump in 2020, planned pre-trial hearings to take place until July 22nd. She said it will be imprudent to set a new trial date given the uncertainties. Special counsel Jack Smith, who brought case, has proposed proceedings commence in July. Trump's lawyers have said it should not begin until after the November 5th election, although suggested, an, suggested rather an August 12th date in reaction to an order from Cannon to promote proposed a timeline for the case. Trump's lawyers have worked to delay all four criminal cases he faces. The other two cases relate to his alleged attempts to overturn the results of the 2020 election. He has already been charged in a Georgia state court over the allegations, while the Supreme Court is weighing Trump's argument that he is immune from federal prosecution in a separate case brought by Smith. Trump has sought to portray all the legal cases against him as politically motivated. The charges in the Florida case include violations of the Espionage Act, which criminalizes the unauthorized possession of national defense information, as well as conspiracy to obstruct justice and making false statement to investigators. Cannon has denied two attempts by Trump to dismiss the charges, but several remain pending. Moving forward, the number of people in Myanmar forced from their homes by conflict now surpasses over 3 million in what the United Nations has described as a bleak milestone for the country. The United Nations said the number of displays had increased by 50% in the last six months as fighting intensified between the military and armed groups trying to remove the generals who seized power in a coup in February 2021. The Office of the United Nations Resident and Humanitarian Co Coordinator for Myanmar said in a statement on Monday, Myanmar has this week marked a bleak milestone with over 3 million civilians now displaced nationwide amidst intensifying conflict. Myanmar stands at the precipice in 2024 with a deepening humanitarian crisis that has spiraled since the military takeover in February 2021 and the consequent conflicts in many parts of the country driving record numbers of people to abandon their homes seeking safety. Of the 3 million internally displaced people, over 90% fled as a result of the conflict talked by the coup, the United Nations added. Around half of the displaced are in the northwestern regions of Chin, Magui and Sage, with over 900,000 in the southeast. Closely, 356,000 people live in the western state of Rakhine, where a brutal military crackdown in 2017 triggered over 750,000 mostly Muslim Rohingya to flee into neighboring Bangladesh. Myanmar was plunged into chaos when Senior General Mi El Liang seized power from the elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi, which led to mass protests that evolved into an armed uprising when the military responded with brutal force. Fighting has deepened since the end of October last year when ethnic armed groups allied with anti coup fighters launched a major offensive in northern Shan and western Rakhine states, overrunning dozens of military outposts and taking control of many major towns near the border with China. The military has also been fighting with ethnic current groups for control of Mia Wadi in recent weeks, a major trade hub on the border with Thailand. The United Nations said the increasing conflict meant that roughly 18.6 million people in Myanmar were now in need of humanitarian assistance, 1 million over in 2023. Xi Jinping pushed back against allegations of his country's support for Russia's war in Ukraine during meetings with European leaders as the Chinese leader makes a six-day visit to the continent amidst a period of rising China-Europe tensions prompted by fears of Beijing's close ties to Moscow. China is neither the creator of the crisis nor a party to it or a participant, but we are also not a bystander. We have always been actively contributing to reaching peace, Xi said during a joint press conference with the French President Emmanuel Macron in Paris on Monday following a day of meetings that also included European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. We also oppose using the Ukraine crisis to share responsibility or defame a third country 
and provoke a new Cold War, Xi added in an apparent reference to allegations from Washington about the role of Chinese dual-use exports like machine tools and microelectronics in supporting Russia's defense industry. European trade frictions with China and suspicions over its global ambitions ramped up in the wake of the war after Beijing refused to condemn the invasion and instead emerged as a key lifeline for the heavily sanctioned Russian economy. Xi's visit to Europe, his first in five years, is viewed by Beijing as an opportunity for the leader to present China's own narrative on its role in the conflict playing out in Europe directly to leaders were while seeking to open up space between the views of Washington and its European allies. The visit will also see Xi visit Serbia and Hungary, while with the leaders visit to Belgrade, coinciding with the 25th anniversary of NATO's bombing of the Chinese embassy in the city that killed three people. The attack, which the U.S. said was an accident, was part of a wide bombing campaign by NATO in the Balkans during the spring of 1999 and drove Beijing's deep enmity for alliance, a view that's since driven it closer to Russia. Again, on judicial matters, the owner of the social media platform TikTok, Byte Dance, has filed a lawsuit against the United States government in an attempt to block a law that will force it to divest from its U.S. assets. Lawyers for Biden on Tuesday filed a complaint in the U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C., arguing the law was obviously unconstitutional. President Joe Biden signed the law less than two weeks ago on April 24th as part of a package that included foreign package to Ukraine and Israel as well as humanitarian relief for Gaza. ByteDance has nine months to sell off its U.S.-based operations under the law. Its deadline is January 19th, with an additional three-month extension possible should a seal be in progress. But in its suit, ByteDance argues that di divestment will not be possible within the time frame allotted, not commercially, not technologically, not legally. It also argues it is being unfairly aimed by a law that violates the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, who which protects free speech. For the first time in history, Congress has enacted a law that subjects a single named speech platform to a permanent nationwide ban and bars every American from participating in a unique online community with over 1 billion people worldwide, the lawsuit reads. While Biden maintains it has no plans to sell TikTok, its popular video sharing app, it said that doing so will not even be visible under the law. Millions of lines of code will have to shift hands, the lawsuit explained, and any prospective owners will have to access Biden's algorithi algorithms to keep it operational, something that will also be barred under the law. The lawsuit said there is no question the act will force a shutdown of TikTok by January 19th, 2025, silencing the 170 million Americans who use the platform to communicate in ways that cannot be replicated elsewhere. TikTok has been an aim of bipartisan criticism in the United States with politicians concerned about its national security implications. ByteDance is a Chinese technology company and its critics fear that the Chinese government could request the information it collects from users raising privacy concerns. U.S. Congress members like Representative Raja Krishnamurthy said the April law is therefore necessary to protect U.S. users. On more stories on floods, Brazil flood says 90 dead desperate rescues on the way. Rescuers are rushing to evacuate people stuck by flood waters across the southern Brazilian state of Rio Grande do Sul, where at least 90 people have been killed and over 130 others are missing. The state capital of Porto Alegre has been virtually cut off by the flooding, with the airport and bus station closed and major roads closed. According to a report, the situation had become very desperate as volunteers and rescue crews tried to evacuate residents. The state's civil defense agency said the death toll has risen to 90, with another four deaths being probed. Another 131 people are still unaccounted for, and 155,000 are homeless. Heavy rains that began last week have caused rivers to flood, flooding wall towns and damaging roads and bridges. In Port Alegre, a city of 1.3 million residents on the Gaiba River, residents face empty supermarket shelves and closed gas stations with shops rationing sales 
of mineral water. Five of Porto Alegre's six water treatment facilities are not working, and Mayor Sebastian Mello on Monday decreed that water be used exclusively for essential consumption. In African shores, Russian Foreign Minister Sierra Leone counterpart discourse ties. Sergei Lavrov, Russian Foreign Minister, recently hosted by his counterpart from Sierra Leone, Timothy Kaba, in Moscow for their liberations targeted at boosting bilateral relations. During the meeting, Kaba extended congratulations to Russian President Vladimir Putin on his re-election victory and subsequent inauguration. Lavrov characterized Sierra Leone as Russia's long-standing and dependable partner in Africa. He disclosed plans to expand diplomatic outreach by opening fresh missions on the African continent, with Freetown being a priority for this year. Lavrov highlighted the significance of translating decisions into action, signifying active measures towards this objective. We plan to open fresh diplomatic missions on the African continent, including in Freetown. In Freetown, we anticipate to do the, it this year, before the end of this year. All the needed decisions have been made. It is necessary to implement them, which is a practical task, and we are working on it. The Russian minister furthermore emphasized potential collaboration in peaceful nuclear energy. These included meetings about the prospect of constructing a nuclear power plant in Sierra Leone. Now I'll take a quick break and when I come back I'll bring you more stories from Nigeria. Don't go anywhere. You're welcome back. Now we're talking politics in Nigeria. We begin with APC demands for virus removal and its anarchy warning. On Tuesday, the River State Government discharged a call on the State House of Assembly by the Caretaker Committee of the All Progressives Congress in the state to begin impeachment proceedings against Governor Simina Lai for Barra. Joseph Johnson, the State Commissioner for Information and Communications, who spoke in Port Harcourt according to report, said the Governor will not let anybody to throw the state into anarchy. Also, Chief Edmund Clark, the leader of the Pan Niger Delta Forum, and other prominent individuals in the region caution the lawmakers against causing anarchy in the state. The APC caretaker committee chairman in the state, Chief Tony Okocha, had earlier on Tuesday called on the 27 members of the State House of Assembly loyal to the Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, Wisdom Wiki, to quickly begin an impeachment process against Fubara. Okocha warned that failure of the lawmakers to heed the directive will attract extreme sanctions in line with significant sections of the party's constitution. The chaos between Fubara and his godfather, Wike, began last year when the assembly, dominated by Wike's loyalists, tried to impeach the governor. The two camps later signed a peace pact following the intervention of President Bola Tinubu, but they had since resumed hostilities as they disagreed on the peace pact. The assembly had at least overridden the governor by passing at least two bills that he withheld assent. Fubara on Monday dismissed the assembly as an illegal body that did not exist. Also, he maintained that eight-point peace agreement brokered by the president was a messly political solution to a problem and not a constitutional issue. Reverse electricity tariff hike and LCTUC tells NERC. It is an understatement to state that numerous Nigerians are groaning under the weight of the latest electricity tariff the federal government enforced on Band A consumers recently. This category of consumers is made up of homes that reportedly enjoy up to 20 hours of electricity a day from 68 naira per kilowatt hour. The tariff went up to 225 naira per kilowatt hour, an increase of over 200%. For now, Band B, C, D, and E are not affected by this pilot phase, but the full cost reflective tariff is built to take effect within a period of three years. A number of stakeholders have asked the government to reverse the tariff hike. The Senate Committee on Power, in its recent interactive session with the Minister of Power, Adebayo Adelabu, and stakeholders in the power sector, joined the call for the reversal of the tariff increase. The Senate had urged the FG, the federal government, not to add the tariff even before the hike on April 3, 2024, saying it was ill-timed. 
It noted that the upsurge came in gross disregard of increased economic challenges with attendant widespread poverty and high cost of living in the country. It implored the government to rather focus on electricity generation and distribution. The lower chamber, the House of Representatives, similarly spoke against the tariff hike, expressing worry over discrepancies in consumer categorization and threats to regulatory certainty and investor confidence in the sector. The House called on the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission, NERC, to suspend the implementation of the electricity hike in the country. As anticipated, the Nigerian Labour Congress, NLC, Trade Union Congress, TUC, and some other bodies like the Nigerian Bar Association, NBA, kicked against this tariff hike and called for a reversal. The NLC and the TUC gave the NERC and power sector operators one week ultimatum to reverse the electricity tariff hike. On Wednesday, in a joint speech to mark the 2024 Workers' Day in Abuja, President of NLC Joe Ajairo and that of the TUC Festus Asifo bewailed the poor state of the Nigerian economy due to majorly poor leadership and policies. Our nation faces escalating poverty, dwindling opportunities, and widespread delusionment. Genuine businesses struggle, unemployment soars, and the government remains indifferent. The labor leaders regretted. In condemning the tariff search, the MBA Ikeja branch called it unjust, illegal, and lacking empirical basis. It threatened to take legal action if the government and concerned individuals failed to reverse the hike within seven days after it addressed the press. The National Association of Nigerian Students now threatened to hold a nationwide protest on May 7, 2024, against fuel scarcity and electricity crisis. The organized private sector OPS said the policy will worsen the cost of doing business in the country. In spite of these condemnations and fears, the power minister and the NERC have continued to justify the addition. According to Adil Abu, the hike was to stop a complete collapse of the power sector. He made reference to outstanding debts or generating companies, Jenko, said to amount to about 1.3 trillion naira and to gas companies and noted that government will require 10 billion US dollars every year for the next 10 years to fix the power sector. He said his ministry required over 2 trillion naira for electricity subsidy this year, whereas the government only budgeted 450 billion naira for it. And finally, on the news, Waliki says Sibian Chu retracts cyber security levy. An ex commissioner for finance in Imo State, Professor Uche Waliki, has urged the Central Bank of Nigeria CBN to instantly withdraw the latest circular directing banks to charge 0.5% levy on electronic transactions. Such withdrawal was against the backdrop of assurances by the government that its plan to add revenue will not include introducing new taxes or increasing tax rates, according to him. Responding to the Apex Bank's directive, Waliki, who is the director of the Institute of Capital Market Studies, National State University, described the levy as ill-timed, coming at a time when the CBN is worried about the high rate of financial exclusion and the increasing rate of currency circulating outside the banks. The levy, he argued, carries the downside risk of discouraging financial intimidation, as well as complicating the transmission of monetary policy with more people snubbing the banks due to high charges. The end result, he noted, is that it makes difficult efforts by the central bank to tame inflation. A recap of major stories says U.S. holds Israel weapons amid Rafa concerns. Judge indefinitely delays Trump's classified documents case. United Nations say three million flee Myanmar conflict. Xi counters claims of China aiding Russia in Ukraine. And Biden sues U.S. over TikTok. Say law, and that's all on the news. Thanks for watching. I am Lloyd Strike.